today I am excited because I'm actually um, shadowing the anesthesiologist in our hospital. So um, I am kind of excited to be able to ask them questions, get to pick their brains a little bit, understand um, their thought process and procedures a little bit better. And I'd be lying if I didn't say that I still consider certain things that I could be doing in the future, such as going back to school, um, potentially becoming a CRNA, um, and things like that. So I feel like shadowing them will actually give me some insight into some of that, help me f see where I'm feeling in, in terms of is this something I would take interest in in the future. So I'm excited to um, kind of talk to you guys about that today. Obviously I can't show you what's going on inside or um, my provider interactions, but um, I will tell you guys as much as I can later and um, what my experience was like. Hey guys, welcome back. So obviously because I couldn't show you a lot of what was going on in the hospital, I wanted to make sure that I sat down and chatted with you guys about kind of how the day went following anesthesia. So first off, I had a fantastic time. Um, some people may find it boring, but I had the ability because I have some rapport with the anesthesiologist to bounce around between ORs and kind of see different things going on. Um, that way I wasn't stuck in one OR room for like four hours, just kind of sitting there with the anesthesiologist um, as they just made minor tweaks and adjustments for the patient. So I kind of got to bounce around and see a couple different things, which made the day very fun, very exciting, and gave me the opportunity to ask lots of questions. So the main reason why I shadowed, um, there's two reasons. The first one is because I have considered CRNA school, which um, I don't know if that's the route for me, but being able to shadow and job shadow is a great way to find out whether or not um, a job is something that you should consider continuing with. Um, so I don't think that I will be a CRNA, at least not anytime soon. That doesn't mean that that door is completely shut for me, but it gave me some insight. Um, but then two, for my job, I wanted um, more rapport with the anesthesiologist. And when I get the chance to go back and ask questions and talk to them, I feel like um, we see each other a little bit more as like colleagues and a little less as like, you know, I'd get my orders from them and I implement the orders from them, but they can see my knowledge base and I can see theirs and we learn to appreciate each other for that. And that's the experience that I had. So one of the first things that I learned is um, how to intubate someone um, by watching the anesthesiologist. And um, I learned that they can do it one of two ways. Um, one is by using a glide scope. Um, in order to kind of visualize and see on a camera vocal cords and the tip of the epiglottis better, which are kind of your landmarks when you're putting in the endotracheal tube. And I'll try to find an image to put up here or just on the next um, couple of minutes. But basically, you have your drill scope, which um, kind of opens up the jaw so you can see your landmarks better. And then um, you have your ET tube that you're going to slide in there. Um, so basically the glide scope will go um, kind of in the mouth so you can see those landmarks better and more up close, if you will. Um, but you can also intubate someone without the glide scope and just using the laryngeal scope, you just have to eyeball it yourself as you're standing over the patient in order to slip the ET tube down. So I got to see that done both ways, which was really fascinating. Um, usually as a former CVIC nurse, when we would intubate someone, I was the person um, prepping the meds, drawing them up and handing them to anesthesia, um, pulling the bed out and making sure the head of the bed was off so that they could visualize things better, making sure that suction canisters were set up, making sure that the code cart was nearby if necessary, and that um, we also had like a presser in case like their blood pressure dropped after the sedation. So those were all my roles. So it was kind of cool to stand up in the front with anesthesia and see what their role was and um, why they would use different sedatives versus uh, different paralytics. So the next thing, and I'm gonna try to talk about this from a standpoint 
as if you don't know anything like I didn't to begin with. Obviously at this point in my career, um, I kind of had an idea what was going on, but it's still fun to discuss it. And so um, basically when the anesthesiologist is getting ready to intubate someone, they will um, give them a sedative to put them to sleep first and then a paralytic. The reason we do it in that order is because you don't want to paralyze someone before you sedate them because that is a very, very scary scenario for the patient where you can't move, you can't talk, you can't do anything, and you're just sitting there waiting to go to sleep. So we never, ever, ever paralyze them first. Um, so we sedate them so they're asleep and then paralyze them. That way it's easier to like get down their throat and um, the muscles are relaxed, if you will. So um, the anesthesiologist will choose both of those give them um, and then they will hyper oxygenate the patient as well. They'll give them 100% oxygen for a couple minutes while they're falling asleep. Um, that way when they remove the oxygen because you don't want anything in the way as you're intubating, um, they have a little bit of a reserve before you go and you take your time to get the endotracheal tube in. So hopefully all that's making sense. From there, the patient um, will get attached to a ventilator, which is the breathing machine um that does the breathing work for the patient until they wake up again some patients will either be given anesthesia gas during the whole procedure and some patients will um, just be run on a sedative drip the whole time so all that to say they will be on a ventilator um, and they will have the mask on them still depending on what kind of airway it doesn't always have to be an et tube sometimes it's a um, laryngeal mask airway which kind of looks like an ET tube, but the end is much different and wider. Um, and sometimes they'll just have an oral airway, which if you saw the very front picture of this video, that is the little icon that I have in the front. And again, I'll try to add some pictures as I'm speaking, but um, I may be missing a couple things, but these are the things that I learned and got to refresh in my memory. And from there, anesthesia just monitors um, the vitals. They manage the ventilator settings to make sure the patient's doing okay. Um, based on your ventilator settings and your vitals, you can kind of tell if they could be in pain or if they're close to waking up and need some more sedation, um, let's say. And so they just kind of manage from that end of things until it's time to wean the patient off of the anesthesia or sedative and start to wake them up again. Um, obviously a lot of things can go wrong, so you have to have a higher degree in order to make those shots and calls, but um, it was really interesting to also talk to anesthesia about why they would choose different types of sedatives. For example, we talked about why we would use automidate, which is what I use the most frequently in the cardiac ICU, and that's because it's cardioprotective. Um, it has less damage on the heart. Um, sometimes we would use succinylcholine, but um, that can cause an influx or release of potassium. So if the patient's potassium was high, um, then you don't usually wanna give sex because then you'll have this huge rush of it. Um, so anyways, I hope that you found this video somewhat interesting like I did. If you have um, questions or wanna talk about it, I will try to answer some of the questions down below. I wish that I had an anesthesiologist here with me to answer questions, but um, this is just my perspective on what I learned as a nurse, and um, I don't think we give our anesthesiologists enough credits, same with our CRNAs, um, but it was just a fun day, and I'm very grateful and thankful that they let me watch them and um, talk to me and ask me questions and treated me as a colleague, which is not something that we get super often as nurses when we work with doctors, unfortunately. So yeah. I hope that you guys will continue to watch my channel. If you enjoyed this video or want to see more like it, hit that subscribe button and like this video and I will try to produce more content for you guys. Love you all. As I always say, tutonana until we meet again.